right, well, you may be seated. Um, we got a couple of uh, business things to take care of before we start. So middle school kids, please, um, or yeah, middle school, please stay in the service for a minute while I'm talking about this. So you guys can see this, and hopefully online you guys can see it as well. Caitlin, is it in the photo? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, so this is going to be our uh, final four sermon series. Uh, so what we're doing right now is if you look in your bulletin, there should be a little piece of paper with some lines on there where you guys can um, put in your recommendations. So what we're asking is that if you guys have any topics that you want to hear about, anything that you want to be spoken of from the sermon here, anything that you want to hear Scott or any of us teach on, we ask that you'd write that sermon topic down in that little note that's in your uh, in your bulletin. And for everybody online, there's a poll in the members group that you can go and add in your own ideas. Um, last week, we had some people starting to vote on different ideas, but we'll be doing the voting starting next week. So whatever topics you guys bring today, this is the last opportunity to have any idea of, or put in your idea, and then we'll start voting on it as a congregation next week. And what will happen is we'll finally get down to the final four sermon topics, and whatever those four sermon topics are that you guys are voting on, that's what we'll be preaching on. So... Um, just want to give you a little heads up there. Um, now, middle schoolers, you are dismissed uh, to go to your class. Um, though I think they are all gone again. All right. And they did that to me last service, too, which is perfect. They know where they, where they want to be. All right. Well, uh, good morning. My name is Chase Bolster. I am an associate pastor here at Lakes Community Church. Um, actually been preaching to you guys for about a year now. Most of you are still here, which is good. So... That's good. Um, started November 10th of last year. I was actually supposed to preach on the 8th, but I got sick. So now I'm here talking to the 8th today. Um, all right, so we are wrapping up the Feast of Israel today. And I can say that I am genuinely very excited to talk about this feast. I think I got one of the best ones to talk about. Uh, and, uh, well, I don't think that I can talk about everything that's in it today, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Uh, however, I just want to recap some of the previous feasts that we went through. So the first feast that we talked about was Passover. I talked about how Christ is our Savior. Uh, he's the one that's going to be saving us from death. Uh, the second one was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We found out that Christ is the pure, um, unchangeable sacrifice and the one who's going to sustain us. Uh, I also talked about fluffy bread and how it's delicious. Uh, first, yes, first fruits. Uh, we found out that Christ is the firstborn of all creation and from the dead, uh, which is proving that he is the one and only Savior that could ever potentially save us. Then we saw Pentecost, which is a picture of us getting the Holy Spirit. And I'll be talking a lot about water today. And so whenever I talk about water, just be thinking about the Holy Spirit in the back of your mind. Uh, after the Pentecost, we talked about the Feast of Trumpets, which is a reminder of the glory of God and a call for repentance. And do you guys remember when we did the return event? That the 10 days of awe, the 10 days of repentance started with the Feast of Trumpets. We had the 10 days of repentance, and it was like on day seven or day eight, we had the actual return event. And then about three days after the actual event was the Day of Atonement. So we just, just blew right past it just a little bit ago. And we saw that in the Day of Atonement um, and in the 10 days of repentance, how God uh, showed Israel and shows us that we need atonement, that we need the Savior. And not only that, but that he is not only able, but he is willing to save us. Now, that brings us, amen to that, right? Amen. That brings us today to the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, or just simply the Feast. Uh, and I think that we will see the culmination of all the other feasts playing out in this one. I think it's all the other feasts are leading up and pointing to this particular feast. And it, 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 I'm excited about it. So, um, I may start talking a little fast. I'm going to do my best to, to keep it at a slower pace, but uh, we'll see how that actually plays out. So, and one of the reasons why I think that this feast is the perfect fulfillment of all the other feasts is um, if we, we're not going to read it today, but I put all the scripture references. They should be at the top of your notes, so Leviticus 23, Numbers 29, and Deuteronomy 16. Those are all the um, scriptures in the Torah that speak about this feast. Anyways, when we read in Numbers, we see that they start off with 13 bulls on the first day. Uh, for sacrificing, it'll be like 13 bulls, two goats, the grain offering, oil offering, like a bunch of other stuff. And then on the second day, it will be 12 bulls, and then all the same sacrifices. And the third day, it's 11 bulls, and all the way down to seven. Then on the seventh day, you have seven bulls, and just with all the sevens in the seventh month. Uh, so I just think that it is the perfect fulfillment because the number seven is the number of completion. 
Um, so I think that it is a, a completion that shows the perfect relationship with the Father. It's where we're finally able, or Israel was finally able to enter into the glory and the presence of God. Because all the sacrifices, there was a finality to it. I hope that we're able to see that. All right, and as a piece of booze, they're coming into the glory and the presence of the Lord. And what is our inheritance as Christians? We get to boldly go before the throne of God. So I think this is also speaking to that future reality that we get to live out today, which we've already done. Hopefully, at least. All right, so I do want to lay out how we're going to be addressing this today, so that way you can, you can track with me. Uh, we're going to be talking about this feast in four distinct ways. The first way we're going to be looking at it in a historical lens, we're going to try to view what it was to the Jewish nation when they were the nation. So we'll be looking in the Old Testament. There are uh, two key verses that speak about it, uh, that we'll be able to see the Jews actually practicing this feast. Um, hint that there wasn't, they didn't actually celebrate it very much. There's an odd amount of silence in the scriptures in regards to this feast. There's only two instances where I can think of uh, that the Jews actually practice it out for us to be able to see it. Um, well, at least two key instances. But then there are other places that it talks about it. But anyway, so we'll be talking about it historically. Next, we'll move on and we will address it in how Christ um, celebrated it in his ministry. All of John chapter 7 and some of John chapter 8, that's Christ celebrating the Feast of Booths. And uh, I do just want to say that, you know, I thought that I was pretty darn familiar with that chapter. I like a lot of the stuff that happens in that chapter, but it is just, there's a whole new depth to it after I've studied the, the feasts here, after I've been prepping for this. There's just a whole new depth, and I hope that you guys are able to see that too today, and I hope that you're able to uh, partake in some of the joy that the Lord has given me over this. You know, I, I'm excited that I get to preach a sermon on joy. It's, it's awesome. Uh, so third, um, we will look to its future fulfillment, as in when Christ comes back for his second coming. So we'll take a brief look at that. Not, we won't stop there too long, uh, but we will talk about it because I think that it gives us a very unique perspective. And then fourth and finally, we will attempt to address what the Feast of Booths means to us today for Christians in 2020, almost 2021. So I'm going to try to wrap it up in time for the end of that. Um, but with that being said, I'd like you guys to all pull out your Bibles and turn to Leviticus chapter 23, and we will read that together. In all fairness, I didn't think Carl was going to be here today, so that's, I'm using my phone. <laughs> he surprised me, though. All right. I'll get a stern talking to you later, I'm sure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, I'll start off in verse 33. All right. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. That's a, a gathering together. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides your vows, and everything... And besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord, basically he's saying these are all offerings on top of what you're already doing. Verse 39, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered all the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day, there's uh, a Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in its year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feasts of the Lord. All right, they, that may not seem particularly significant yet. It may not seem exceptionally joyful, hopefully yet, 
But I will tell you that this is an amazing feast, and the reason why we're going to be looking at it historically is so that we can go beyond just the, the law of it, but we can really get to the heart of it, of why they celebrate and why this was known as the, one of the most joyous feasts that the Jews ever uh, had. Um, and that was actually one of your first fill-in-the-blanks, which I definitely skipped ahead on. But anyways, here it is. The Feast of Tabernacles, or Sukkot and Booths, they're all the same celebration. Uh, oftentimes in Scripture, the Feast of Booths is referred to simply as the feast, since it was the most joyous and anticipated feast of Israel's calendar. So typically, if you see a mention in the scriptures and it says, and they were celebrating the feast, it's usually a reference to the Feast of Booths uh, or Tabernacles or, or Sukkot, however you want to say it. I know there's like four ways to pronounce Sukkot. I'm probably doing it one of the wrong ways. But I, I want to keep in mind that uh, the Israelites would begin prepping for this feast immediately after the Day of Atonement. So it's like they were repenting, it was the Day of Atonement, and it's almost like they're like, all right, well, time to build our booth. And they'd go out and they'd collect all the wood and collect all the different branches from the different trees, and they would put together this little booth. Um, now, I think that there, there are quite a few reasons for why they had to build a booth. Now, when they built these booths, uh, we'll see a picture of it later on. When they built them, they, they had to leave the roof uh, slightly open so that they could see the stars through the roof, which also meant that rain could come down into it. Uh, and there are some commentators that I read about that some say that you have to stay in there unless it's a substantial amount of rain, and others would say, no, it's okay, you can go inside. But ultimately, what this booth is representing is a leaving of the provisions that we think that we've made for ourselves and entering into a state of where we're totally reliant on the Lord because he's the one that controls the weather. Um, Oh, yes, and also the fact that it's right after the Day of Atonement. I don't think there was any better time for the people of Israel to try to come into the joy and come into the presence of the Lord, except for right after the day when all of their sins had been atoned for by the high priest. Okay, so it's right on the heels of this that they're coming in, and so that's kind of setting the stage for us. This is right on the heels. All of their sins have been paid for. They are now able to come into the glory of the Lord, and it's an exciting time for them. And I also believe that most of the joy of this day comes um, from being right with God and for living, um, they're living in a moment of fulfilling their purpose as the Israelite people. They were to be a people pointing to the Lord, right? That was their purpose. They were to be a priestly nation among the nations to point everybody to the Lord. And so this is when they're entering into the presence of the God. This is their fulfillment of who they are. So it is a very joyous day. Now, again, it is called the Feast of Booths because the people are commanded to live in booths uh, in temporary shelters that they built using branches from the surrounding area. Now, the shelters, again, could not have a completed uh, roof, and this was to be a reminder of Israel's time in the wilderness. Now, looking back to when they spent the 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, this was a, a feast, a joyous feast, to remember that extremely difficult and slightly dark period in their history. Now, not only do I think that it's talking about the wilderness, but I think that the language is also to be reminiscent of Abraham. Because when Abraham came into the promised land, God said, hey, this is your land, this is for you to live in, this is for you and your people. When Abraham came into the promised land, he never built a, a permanent structure for himself to live in. He never built a permanent structure. He remained dwelling in tents, in what we would call temporary structures. So I think that this is to be reminiscent not only of their time in the wilderness, but also of Abraham. And it's, it's as if Abraham was saying to his future descendants, saying, hey, this is the promised land. This is the land that God has given me and given to you. However, this is not our home. Our home is with our God. Our home is being in the presence of the Father. That's our home. Amen? Amen. So I think that's what it's supposed to be reminiscent of. So they were not only to be reminiscent of the wilderness where God provided for them. And when we think about the wilderness, what do we think about? For those of you that, that know, yeah, manna. The, the bread came out of heaven. There was nearly a million people walking through the wilderness, not just with themselves, but also with all of their cattle. They had to have food out of somewhere. And they're wandering around all the time. So manna came out of heaven on the ground. They'd be able to collect it in the morning. And then also, what else was provided for them? Moses came up and he, he struck a rock, and out of it came just this gushing river of water that was able to sate the thirst of a million people and 
other animals, which is an incredible provision. And not only that, but they also had, at moments, a tornado guiding them in the day and then a, a blazing fire tornado at night that was able to guide them for, for a period of time in the wilderness. So there was these three amazing, supernatural, unexplainable, unavoidable instances of God's provision. That without that, the Jewish people would have perished. That's what they're remembering. The joy comes from remembering what God has done for them. So it was to be a reminder of Israel's time in the wilderness. But I, I also want to go back and point out that it was, they were to remember how Abraham was also honoring God and how he lived daily. Because, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but when you go camping, you don't feel secure in that tent as you do if you're in a you know, trailer or even at your own home. There's something about having solid walls around you that can give you some peace. It's a reminder that God planned everything. It's a reminder that God provided everything. And I think that we all need reminders that we are not the source of our own provision. We are not the source of our own provision. I think that's part of them leaving their household and coming out and building this temporary shelter was saying, hey, God has given me all of that, but he wants me to come into his presence and I'm gonna do what he has commanded me to. It's a reminder that God was the one that had provided everything that they had. See, I think that the incredible joy of this feast is directly connected with the obedience of Israel. Now, it, it seems because scripture is relatively silent on this feast, it doesn't talk about it a whole lot, it seems that the Jews weren't celebrating it on a regular basis. But we do see from tradition that it was being celebrated on a regular basis shortly before the time of Christ. Now, all before their history, um, I only know of really two instances where they, they truly celebrated it in a really joyful fashion, and uh, we're going to be reading that really quick. And, and the reason why we're going to go and read both of these is because I believe that these verses give us the, the, the nature of what the feast was supposed to be. So, and we're going to have to do a little bit of reading in between the lines here. Not too much, though. So, in your Bibles, turn to 1 Kings uh, chapter 8. And then we will be in verses 62 all the way through the end of the chapter. And this will really give us a picture of what the feast was supposed to be. Um, I will say that this is when Solomon had built the temple. David wanted to build the temple. God said, no, you have too much blood on your hands, but I'll raise up a son for you to be able to build a temple. And I think that that was talking about two different people, one Solomon who's going to build the temple, and then also Christ who was the temple to come among us. But anyways, this is in the moment of an extremely joyful period in, in Israel's history because this is when they first build the temple for God's presence to dwell in. That beautiful, gorgeous Solomon's temple that the Lord was going to come and dwell in. And right before this happens, they actually say that they sacrifice an uncountable number of animals to the Lord out of their joy and reverence for him. And let's read really quick. Uh, verse 62. Then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. These are more sacrifices. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So what was the number that was uncountable before? A lot, of, a lot of offerings. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. At that time, Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, before the Lord our God, seven days, and seven more days, 14 days. They were so excited, they partied for 14 days. Hey, amen. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went to their own tents, joyful and glad of heart, for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David, and for, his, and for Israel, his people. There is a lot of joy happening in this moment. I mean, can you guys imagine the celebration? I didn't look up the, you know, from Hamath to Egypt, but I imagine it wasn't a small distance. 
There was a lot of people in this amazing, joyous feast. And one thing that I do want to point out is that the, the, temp, the temple that Solomon built had been finished for quite a while before they actually dedicated it to the Lord. See, Solomon wanted to wait. I think it was up to about seven months, possibly, that Solomon waited to dedicate the temple because they wanted to do it on the Feast of Booths. He was waiting for this day. And if the king of an entire nation postponed the dedication of the temple to their holy God, which is the only reason that they exist, I think that we can understand that this is a very important and monumentous feast. Now, the next one that I want to go to really quick is in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 14. All right, and they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, and that they should announce and proclaim in all of their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches, bring branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of leafy trees to make booths as it is written. Then the people went out and brought them and made for themselves booths, each one on the roof of his house or in the courtyards or in the courts of the house of God, and in the open square of the water gate, and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So, whole assembly of everybody, okay, everybody did it. Everybody went out and made it. Now, what's happening right now here, this is a completely different time in Israel's history. This is when they are now just first coming back from captivity in Babylon. And they had forgotten as a nation about the Feast of Tabernacles. They had forgotten the Feast of Booths, this most joyous feast, until they were coming back to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so both times, both times that we see this in the Old Testament, it is revolving around the building of the temple. It's revolving around the presence of the Lord. It's revolving around a joyous occasion where God is restoring or giving out blessings to his people. Both times we see that this is an exceptionally joyous feast. And you may not feel it right now, but we're going to, hopefully we'll be able to feel it in a couple minutes, just how joyous this occasion actually is. Um, and I think that these two instances show us what the feast should have been throughout all of their history. It was something that was exceptionally exciting to partake in. Okay, so that is the historical nature. It's probably the little bit more boring part of today, but I want to bring us into John chapter 7 now. And it worked out last time, uh, so I just want to do it again. I'm going to read the majority of John chapter 7 to us today. One, because that's what we used to do uh, back in the day as Christians. They would come together and they would read the scriptures, although that was largely in part because people couldn't read. Uh, but also, I, this entire chapter is Christ celebrating the Feast of Booths. So I don't really want us to miss any details in it. Now, we'll be keying on a few details but I want us to, to try to understand as much of what's going on so that way we can try to put ourselves in the place of where Christ is at. All right, so turn with me to John chapter 7. All right, here we go. Buckle in. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. That's the feast we're talking about today. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret, while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers, sorry, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Verse 10. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. Others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. And when it says the Jews, it's referencing the, the leaders. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? 
Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he who they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly. And I just want to stop for a moment, and it's... Jesus is like, hey, you're trying to kill me. And they're like, what? No. Jesus, we don't want to kill you. You're just, no. And then later on, they're like, yeah, this is the guy that they want to kill. All right, I'll slow down. Uh, Caitlin, in the first service, she was sitting up here, and all I had to do was glance down, and she'd give me the look. She's like, slow down. Stop. <laughs> first couple times I ever preached, she actually had a sign, um, and she would hold it up, and it was like, slow down. <laughs> So she just sent me a text uh, telling me to slow down. <laughs> I'm excited, okay? This is a really cool service. This, this is a really cool feast. There's a lot of joy. In it. There, there's a lot to it. So <laughs> I'm just excited. All right. Uh, all right, so they're trying to kill Jesus, but they weren't, but they were. All right, do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? Verse 27. However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Then Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me and know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. That's a really bold claim. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer and then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me and where I am, you cannot come. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now, if you guys have been zoned out a little bit, this is really where we need to focus in together. Verse 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, okay, this is the day when they're down to seven bowls, this is the, the day where that completion of the sacrifices was being made. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. Okay. In Christ's time, there was some new and interesting developments in the feast. The first one involved a water offering that the high priest would draw from the pool of Siloam. So it's in the middle of this feast. Everybody would come for this feast. Jerusalem would be absolutely packed once again. And this high priest, now we, we talked about it last week, Scott talked about it last week, about how the high priest would be in these beautiful, glorious robes that were supposed to represent the glory of God, right? Remember that? Yep, yep. okay. So close your eyes, if you will, with me. And I'm going to try to paint a picture for you so that way you can be in the crowd when Jesus is talking. You're in Jerusalem. You are just packed in this crowd you can smell the amazing foods being baked for this feast. And you are way too excited for what the high priest is about to do. Because every year, the high priest will come out wearing the robes that represent the glory of God, and he'd walk down to the pool of Siloam, and he would kneel down, and he would take 
a cup of water out of it. And then he'd stand up and he'd turn around and his procession would go with him and they would go back to the altar and then they would pour it out as a drink offering to the Lord. And you are so excited for what just happened because that means that rain will come on the crops for next year and you guys will have plenty of food. You are excited because this feast is all about entering into the presence of the Lord And you are happy because you are honoring the Lord and you as a nation are obeying the Lord by doing this drink offering. You're just about to jump with joy because of what's going on. But then you hear from the crowd, you hear that teacher, and he says, any who are thirsty, come to me. And you will never thirst again. And out of you, living waters will flow. You think, I never have to, I don't need rain anymore. I can just depend on, the, on this living water that this man will give me? What's that living water? And, and can you see how your excitement would transfer from what the high priest was doing to what our high priest was proclaiming? Mm-hmm. You can open your eyes. Um, Jesus was taking something. This was a, a, this was a ritual that had developed because they wanted to honor and glorify God. They wanted to pour out a drink offering saying, Lord, please bring us rains for next year because this was at the harvest, right? And so they pray for, for rains for the future. And it was in the moment of the nation of Israel crying out to God for water, crying out to God to provide for him that he says, I am the only provision you need. I am the only source of water you will ever need. It's in the middle of this feast where they are remembering how God provided rivers of water when Moses struck the rock. It's in the moment of remembering those rivers of water that they hear Christ proclaim, I am the living water. Isn't that cool? Doesn't that add some extra depth to what we're reading in John 7? I mean, I'm like, hey, water, cool. But I also have a tap at home. I don't have a well. (laughs) It is amazing what Jesus is doing because he's taking something very real that that the Jewish people needed. They depended on this. Without this, they would die. And he was saying, I'm that provision. Come to me. See, what the priest was giving as a symbol is what Christ was offering freely. You catch that? The high priest was giving us a symbol, and that symbol is pointing to what Christ, our high priest, was actually freely giving to us, offering to us. Yeah, water and living water. Okay. Now, there was another kind of ritual that they did that was absolutely fascinating to me. Um, it was actually, I went over to Scott's library uh, to try to take a look, see if I could get anything to help me with this because it's been kind of a struggle studying for these Feasts of Israel. And he's been holding out on me. He straight up has an entire book on the Fall Feast of Israel. just hiding in his library. And so I was able to get a hold of that. I was like, yes, this is amazing. And what it talked about was that the, the priests would take some of their old garments and then kind of soak them in oil and then they would, all throughout the city, they would set up these big torches for light. And, and one of the commentators, if I'm remembering correctly, said that it was almost, it would be so bright that nobody would need their own lantern. So here we are, we're in this feast. And then if we look over at John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says this to them. He says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And now they're in between the verses that I read in chapter 7 and chapter 8 right there, there's the story of the adulterous woman. And, and most Bible scholars think that that story was just kind of like a, oh, yeah, Jesus did this too and slapped it in the middle of what was going on in the, in the feasts. Um, so it, it's more than likely that Jesus was actually still in the midst of the Feast of Booths when he was saying this. He was probably in the light of the lanterns, if we know anything about Jesus and how he decided to teach. He was probably standing in the light of those torches saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light. I am the one that's going to reveal to you who God is. I'm the one who can reveal to you the right path. So not only is Jesus saying that he is the water, which reminds us of the rock that Moses struck in the wilderness, 
but he's also saying that I am the light of the world, which should be reminiscent of perhaps that blazing tornado that they had in the wilderness. And then in chapter 6, if we go back and read, Jesus says that I am the bread of life. And what did we see in the wilderness but the bread of heaven coming down to sustain all of Israel? This Feast of Booths was to recall all of these things to the memory of the Israelites. This is what they were celebrating. And here comes Jesus saying, hey, guess what? It's me. I'm the joy that you're celebrating. I'm the sustaining power that you're looking for. It's me. I am So Jesus, the Feast of Booths, uh, was a time of reflection and looking forward, a time to remember God's goodness and a time to look forward to his glory. Like I was just saying, it was in the time of them remembering God's goodness that they were able to see a portion of Christ's glory in the flesh with them. And this is another line that I stole out of Scott's book, and I absolutely loved it, which is why I kept it. This is what they said. They said, God tabernacled among his people in Jesus. What are tabernacles? They were the temporary booths that the Jews were to build to come into the glory of God. When they were walking with God in the wilderness in his presence, they were in these tabernacles. In the middle of all of Israel living in tabernacles, we see God tabernacling among his people, revealing to them some of the most intense and rewarding truths that humanity has ever heard. I just think that that's interesting. Just let that sink in. God tabernacled among his people. I mean, what does Paul describe these bodies as being? A tent. These are temporary dwelling places. God came temporarily in Jesus and revealed some amazing truths when everybody was temporarily living in these wooden structures. It's just, it just blows my mind and it just makes me so excited like it just, there's just layer after layer after layer of meaning in everything that Jesus is doing. And it's, you know, and it's when we can finally peel back those layers that, oh my gosh, it's just, it's incredible. And so I hope that you guys can sense the joy. I hope you guys can feel the joy of what it would be like for these people to be around Jesus when he was doing this. Oh, it's, it's awesome. I'm just... <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. All right, let's move on to our third way of viewing the Feast of Booths, and that would be its future fulfillment. And let's turn to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. Keep the feast of tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. Okay, this is the kingdom that has yet to come. This is taking place in Christ's second coming. And the Feast of Booths still exists in the next age. Not many things make it through, but this one does. So I want to bring that to your attention so that way we can understand the true significance of this feast. I think that we are pretty far removed from it, but this is an incredibly significant feast where we are to come humbly before the Lord and enter into his glory with joy. It's absolutely incredible. See, this is a future kingdom that Christ will establish at his second coming. Now, this feast, number eight, is used as a condition for the future nations to demonstrate obedience to the Lord. This is for the nations who, you know, in when we describe as Armageddon, when all the nations come and they try to destroy Israel and then God mops the floor with them, he's like, get out of here, these are my people. All the nations who try to destroy Israel are the ones who have to come and celebrate this feast. And if they don't, they don't get any of God's provision. 
But it's interesting to me that there is still a demand for obedience, but still the possibility to not obey in the, in the future kingdom. It's just interesting to me. I won't say anything more on it but that. So number nine, God will still demand obedience, but there seems to still be choice not to obey for those nations. Number 10, the feast is used to demonstrate the joy of being in relationship with the Lord once we are in his presence forever. And what greater joy could there be but to be constantly with God? I don't know if you guys have ever been around someone where just being around them is just a breath of fresh air. When I was younger, I thought that it'd be so boring to be in heaven and all we do is worship and sing. I was like, there has to be more than that. There has to be some snowboarding or something in there. <laughs> I like snowboarding straight into water skiing. That'd be cool. <laughs> but, but ultimately, you know, now that I've been married for five years, I understand what it's like just to be in the presence of someone who gives you a breath of fresh air and how amazing that can truly be. So I think that there is no greater joy than to be in the presence of the Lord. And that's what this feast is talking about. It's giving us a picture of what the future will be like to be with him. Because we can't understand it. So he gives us this weird picture of building these little wooden shacks to come humbly before him. But there's a lot of really good spiritual truths in it. Namely of which, hopefully I timed it correctly. No, I didn't. Okay. I'll skip ahead a little bit. Namely, is that the key lesson of this feast is for us to humbly come before the Lord, remembering all that he has done and longing for all that he will do. I think that's one of the key, some of the key spiritual principles that come out of this feast of tabernacles, is that we are to leave everything that we think that we've built, understanding that it's a provision of God. We are to come and humbly come before him in this little shack, because he doesn't want the things we own. He wants us. Or to try to enter into his glory and into his joy. Now, I think that the notion of dwelling with God forever is the much needed power reset we need in our spiritual lives. I think that it is really easy for us to always be concerned with what's right in front of our face, what's going on in this world right now. And it's easy to forget that Jesus is coming in all of his glory. And we will get to share in his glory if we are truly his followers. If he truly is the living water in us, if he truly is our bread of life, we will get to dwell in his glory and partake in his glory. And that, I don't know how to express that with words. I think it's the reminder that we need here. This feast reveals the priorities that we should have, and that is a perpetually kingdom-focused mindset however hard that is. I think it might be a little bit easier if we went out and built some wooden shacks right now to try to remember what God has given us. But man, on number 11, just focus in on the humbly coming before him and longing for him. I mean, to long after the Lord, that is, that's a gift in itself. This feast is to remind us to long after the Lord. That's a good thing. Number 12, I think what this also teaches us is that we need to deeply understand that God is firmly in control of everything that happens. Even in times of great difficulty, we have a lot to have joy over because of the great I am. I am being Yahweh. When Jesus said before Abraham was I am, he was proclaiming to be Yahweh. Proclaiming to be our God. I mean, if God can take this feast that he gave to the ancient Israelites, which they hardly ever practiced, remind them of it, and then if he comes in tabernacles among his people while all of his people are hanging out in tabernacles, to demonstrate some truth to us today, I think he's in control of everything. I mean, if God can do all of these layers, and I kept saying layers, and I can't think, help but think of Shrek and like the, the onion metaphor. If he can put all of these layers inside of the scriptures for us, then he is definitely in control of everything. I mean, if you look into the history of the Bible and how it's actually survived, it's incredible. So for us in 2020, it's a reminder that we are in a temporary body 
in a temporal world, but we are a part of God's great narrative. We get to enter into God's amazing storyline. This Feast of Booths is a reminder that we get to come boldly before the throne of God. We get to have that living water. We get to partake of that bread. He gets to be the light through which we walk through life. So we can cut through all of the confusion in life. I mean, God has orchestrated everything. So if nothing else, please go home today with some peace, knowing that God is in control of everything that's happening, from your story to the stories of Christians that you've never met. Because we can look back and remember that God provided for Abraham. We can look back and remember that God provided for disobedient and obstinate people in the wilderness. We can look back and remember that he blessed David and Solomon, that he brought his people back out of captivity and restored them to himself. We can see that Christ came as the ultimate fulfillment of it all to die for our sins. And because of all those things, we can trust him with our future because we know that he will establish his kingdom as it was written. And we know that he is in control of our lives today. So I hope that that gives you peace. And I hope that that gives you a lot of joy. And number 13, all the feasts show us more of who Christ is. And I think this feast in particular, again, I want to reiterate this. It resets our perspective to look forward to the inevitable glory of Christ. Because Christ's glory is inevitable. And the more that we internalize that and understand that, I think the more peace and joy that we can take and have and experience in this life. All right, Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you for filling us with your presence. Thank you for tabernacling among your people. God, uh, we are just in such awe of you today. It's hard to describe. But we ask that you'd give us that joy in our hearts as we go through this week. We ask for an extra portion of joy this week, no matter what we're going through, so that way we can remember you and keep that kingdom mindset for you, Father. Jesus, please remind us that everything that we have is a gift from you that you own. God, remind us that our very lives belong to you. Jesus, thank you for who you are. God, thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for putting all of these amazing and intense layers into the scriptures for us to find and have new joy over, Lord. Thank you, Father. Amen. All right, so if you guys need any prayer, we will have prayer teams up here that you can come up and ask for prayer for. Otherwise, uh, don't forget, Encounter Worship is tonight. Yes, Joy. Oh, I'm sorry. I completely forgot to do the picture. Did you guys see the picture of the hut? No. I'm sorry. Can we go back to that really quick? See, like I said, I get excited. (laughs) There it is. That's a modern-ish day version of what they could have been. But, yeah. Yeah. So you dwell in that for an entire week. Get rained on, see the stars, lots of bugs. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't even think about that. 